second uh, talk from Eric Tarbarian um, about uh, how to wiring stuff. Wiring stuff. Yeah, and rewiring stuff. So, uh, yeah, thank you for coming to, uh, to this talk. Uh, actually, if you were uh, in the previous talk, you will see some correspondence in between how we kind of tackle the same problem, but with really different techniques. So that's, that, that sparked lots of ideas in my mind, and that's, uh, I find it really interesting to see how Philip is doing the thing he's doing. So, a question. Oh, that works. Yes, oh, too fast. So, what, what's the best component in the world? What's the best? How would you find the best components? And actually, a function. Functions are, are fantastic components. But I have to say this because that's a functional programming conference, right? So we all love functions. No, I also say this because uh, I really mean it. Functions are, are fantastic as components. They have like this interface where they tell you what they are supposed to do. Uh, they have a name, they take parameters, they give you a result, and then they do their job. And uh, they, are, they are really great as, as components because they can even take other components as parameters. So you have higher order functions. A function taking another function and then it's going to use it to do some stuff. And they are so great that it's actually not one component, but it's actually it's an infinity. In this case, the function takes a parameter, that's A, it's a type parameter, so it can be int, it can be string, you don't care. That means that you have a component for int, a component for string. This is more like an infinity of components. So functions are like fantastic components. And how do they do their job? Well, generally, they just call other functions. So it's a very simple programming model, right? have a function, calling other functions, calling other functions, and all the way down. That's what can you, you cannot do better as far as components are concerned. But they actually have one, one tiny, one, there's one tiny issue with functions, which is also their advantage, is that the function is sealed. Once I give you a function, you can just use it. You cannot really modify it. And, and many times, it's, it's kind of annoying that we cannot modify it. So, it's very good to have functions and components in general for encapsulation because that means you're well isolated for, from any changes. But at the same time, sometimes it's very inconvenient because you're thinking, wow, I know how this function is implemented. If I could just tweak that bit, that would be so helpful for me right now because I'm doing a performance test. I would like just to change that thing to see how it behaves. If it's slightly different, I don't want to rewrite everything. But that's kind of a problem as well. Um, so we're going to leave this problem uh, on the side for a minute because I want to tell you about my hobby. Like, my, what was my hobby for the past three years? It's actually it's been a crappy, crappy, crappy hobby. It's called dependency injection. So <laughs> they go to the music, they go to the cinema, and I, I obsess over dependency injection. That's, that's really bad. But I do this for good reasons. I do this because, um, in particular, when I write on that project at Zalando, they were using what they had in their programming language to create components, to assemble them, and to pass <coughs> them, and so on. And they were using something called the cake pattern. It's a very strange name, but it means that we are using things in Scala that, that are traits. So traits in Scala are interfaces, but it's interfaces of steroids, because you can put some code inside the traits, and you can mix them. So you have a notion of mixing. You can extend a trait, extend another trait. There's even this notion of having self-types, so you can kind of declare that a trait to do its job is going to require in the future another trait and everything will be assembled. And you can also overload and override functions and so on when, when it's needed. And it's actually, it looks nice on paper, but on real projects, it's kind of a nightmare because you tend to have all those traits aggregating all sorts of functions together in like the same namespace, some of them overriding some things, some of them not overriding some things. And it's the kind of mess we are trying to get, in a way, to get away with OO and inheritance and all of that, right? Th that Scala here is not really helping. And it was really a problem for me because that meant that the software I was working on was like very rigid, was very hard to refactor, very hard to test, very hard to understand where things were, were being done. So I set out to find a better solution, like something, okay, can we go back to the roots of the problem and find another solution? And in this talk, I will explore some of those solutions to this problem. So 
one thing you get when you go to functional programming conferences is this idea that we can use a reader pattern to do things. And you can, some talks are like, oh, dependency injection, that's so, so 80s and 90s. Now you have the reader pattern, that's what you should use. So I thought, okay, maybe I should go that way. That's what happens if we use a reader pattern. So if you have a component like this, like an, a client that requires a thread pool, um, you know, to build that client, you need a thread pool. So, well, that's a requirement. It's something that maybe you can, you can get from another component. And in Scala, you can use implicit to say, oh, um, I can, provided that I have a component of type A that eventually is going to bring me that thread pool, well, now I know I will be able to build my HTTP client from that A. I don't have to care right now what that A is, as long as it provides me the thread pool. And then that means you can have like, a cascading dependencies of readers uh, defined uh, with each other until at some point in your application you provide a concrete thread pool. So you need to provide uh, the real one and then it's going to be used recursively by all the readers until you can build your application. And that's quite nice uh, because you can effectively build a full tree. I mean, if your application is a graph like this, so at Zalando it was like web services, so you need a web server, you need to define some routes, and they are going to have some business logic and eventually it's probably going to use some kind of client to other systems or to a database and so on. And, and this reader hierarchy is going to build a full application out of a simple configuration. That's quite neat, but it's not solving the entire problem of doing dependency injection. Because there's this issue that some of the components have to be singleton in a graph like this. Like a connection pool. It cannot be, you cannot have one uh, connection pool per use. It needs to be just one. That's a resource that's really rare. That's the thing you want to control. So, oops, it was too fast. So you want to arrive at this situation. So I thought, well, that's kind of a tree. So what can I do to, to transform my tree to get there? And it turns out that in Scala, there's a, a nice library for tree rewriting. And tree rewriting is a technique that comes from like building compilers where you pass an AST, you get some nodes, and then you make some analysis. You try to transform this AST into something that can be eventually executed. So you rewrite that AST, you decorate it with all sorts of things and so on. And there's been lots of research on that. Uh, and there's uh, like a framework for tree rewriting called Stratego that's been implemented, I think, 20 years ago or something like this. And in Scala, there's a library called Kiyama implementing those ideas using Scala as a language. And with the Scala support, you can effectively rewrite a full tree and you can do lots of interesting things with this. So, well, I, I, I just reused that library and, well, pushed all of this into a, a library called Grafter for doing dependency injection, where you can de define your components as case classes in Scala, have interfaces, and have some configuration and a bit of syntactic sugar and it will do all the wiring for you. That was working more or less nicely. But then I started my first Haskell projects and uh, it was in a context where I told people that use Haskell, it's a great language, we can do great <coughs> services in production, it's not in academia only, we can do nice things. But then I had to prove it, I had to really deliver. And in that situation, I knew I wanted something that was simple enough in terms of dividing my application into components, wiring them, uh, helping people understand the code and so on. So I wanted something that was really simple because we had to work as a team. I could just not go by myself, understand everything I was doing and then go away. And we had also, as Philip was saying, sometimes you want to parallelize the work. So you need to have like clear interfaces and know that one part of the program is not going to have too much influence on the rest so that people can really work independently. That is super important. And I knew that, because I tried them before, that Monad transformers to build a large application were not really cutting it. So Monad transformers are, are on the paper, again, it's a nice idea. You, you add more capabilities on top of a base monad, so now you can write some stuff, you can keep some state, you can you add some stuff kind of linearly on the same base monad. But it turns out that in practice on a large application, it's, it's a nightmare. It's really hard to, 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 to manage, it's hard to refactor again. Sometimes even it's hard to understand 
when you write the program, because of type inference, what exactly the compiler is expecting from you, so you change this, still not happy, you change that, still not happy, and you spend lots of time just fiddling around. So that was not very fun. Um, there was this new thing called the F monad, and uh, it's like mon a monad on steroids with extensible effects, so you can add more effects to the mix, have interpreters for those effects, and I mean, I, I, I went crazy. Uh, I produced a Scala library for it, and we did a full application using the FMonad and so on. And uh, well, a few years later, I wrote this, like a few months ago. Uh, well, free monads, I would not recommend them anymore for all sorts of reasons. Uh, so you can read the, the blog post if you are interested in knowing why, but I would not recommend that for especially for Haskell beginners, if you want to start on a new project, I would not recommend you to, do, to use this. So what should we do? What are we left with in Haskell? Well, there are some ideas that have been around for a long time, uh, especially around how can you avoid using type classes in Haskell? Um, and you have things like the handle pattern or the service pattern. And this idea is very simple, is how to use some simple basic facilities in Haskell to implement components and wire them together. So for example, if I want to do some logging, I can declare a data structure that has, that's going to, to have all my logging functions, info, warn, error, debug, and so on. So it's, it's a record of functions. It's not a classical data type like a person, house, address, whatever. It's a record of functions. And that defines an interface. I don't have to use necessarily in Haskell a type class to define an interface to something. That's one totally valid way to define an interface. And I can provide a constructor for this component. It's just a normal function. So in that case, I'm providing like default implementation for all those functions, uh, print, just printing to the, to the console. I can also I can give now another implementation of this same interface, just doing nothing. If I don't want to see all my tests littered by useless information, I can just uh, pass a no-logging implementation and it will be fine. Um, and then I can make all of this more complicated. So I can have components that depend on other components. So I can have an authentication component, uh, just having an authentication function. And if I want to build that component, well, I can have some requirements for it. Uh, possibly a piece of configuration, possibly it's going to do a bit of logging. And, and so on, and this, I can use those dependencies to build this, uh, this component, to implement all the functions like this. But then I'm left with this problem that I had before, uh, that if I build a tree of components like this, how can I get back my singletons again, right? Uh, and as we saw in Scala, there's a trick, which is tree rewriting. Uh, but tree rewriting uses the fact that in Scala you can pull a case class apart, see all the parts inside the case class, and use reflection essentially to re recreate stuff. And in Haskell, well, there are some reflection facilities, but people generally don't advise you to use that. So I could not really use reflection to do it. So that means uh, there, there's a need to change the, the strategy for all of this. So instead of trying to build my application and then tweak it, uh, maybe the idea is to build it right away with the shape I, I want exactly. So maybe what I should do is to specify exactly the shape of what I want and have some code that's going to build me exactly that shape, right? That would be the best. And so I started playing with some ideas around this. And one, one critical constraint is again this, uh, this, this need for having a singleton. So if you want to make sure that one, when you build something once, you, you reuse the same thing over and over, well, you need to put it somewhere. You need to put it aside, and the next time you need it, you can say, oh, well, now I have it, so I can reuse that thing. I don't have to rebuild it again. So I implemented a, a case class like this, like register, meaning if I need a component of type A, probably there's a way to produce it, and once I've produced it, I can register it, and then it can be reused later on by other uh, components needing it. And then another um, uh, type class called make, saying, okay, how can I make a component of type A? Well, provided I have access to some state that's going to store everything that I've built before so that I don't have to rebuild them again, I know that I can build uh, something of type A. 
And then I can provide some instances for that thing. So I can say, uh, well, um, I want to build an authentication component. So I want to provide an instance to make it available. And provided that I know how to make the config, provided that I know how to uh, create a log logging component, I should be able to create my authentication component. And this kind of works. Uh, because, I mean, I have all the pieces I need here. I have the register tag class to give me access to what was created before. I have the make tag class to, to make new stuff if I need to. So this is all boilerplate that's implemented in this create2 uh, function here that, that knows how to build two dependencies and provide them to a new constructor, the new constructor here, this one. And it's, it's kind of ugly because I, I'm it's not really abstracting over of the arity of the constructor. So as you can imagine, if I have a constructor taking now three arguments, I have to use the create three function. Huh? And then I have one more dot to add here. Because, because actually there's a nice solution for this coming from the universum uh, prelude in Haskell. Uh, there's a, an operator called dot 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 that does this for you. So you can put dot 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 and it's going to magically uh, understand the exact arity and do the right thing. So that's great. But I didn't know about that at the time. And the other issue is that um, it's also a bit of boilerplate because when I define my constructor new, I'm already defining all the dependencies that I need. I, I'm saying I need some config, I need some logging. I'm already saying this. Why do I have to repeat myself in this type class here? Why do I have to repeat it again and again? So those are small things, but if you build a li large software, that means that refactoring becomes more and more painful every time you want to change a small thing. It spreads, you have to change more things around. So that was not so nice, but I mean, at least I had a working solution that was not even involving crazy uh, typery tricks with uh, the F monad or difficult to understand stack, stack uh, monad stacks with the MTL. So I had something to work with. And the, the concrete data structure for holding all the components that I was building on the fly was having like two different parts. The first part was like the mandatory information things that I know I'm there from the beginning, like all the configuration, for example. I don't have to, to, uh, to ask the registry if they are maybe there. I know they are here. And then there, there's all the optional parties, the things I'm building on the fly. But eventually, you can create a registry with your base configuration like this, with a, slight, a bit of syntactic sugar. And you can say, OK, I want my metric store to uh, have this configuration, uh, publication should be like this, and so on and so forth. And that means you can have different configurations, one for uh, production, one for development, one for integration, and you have access to all sorts of functions to uh, extend this configuration, remove stuff, and so on. So um, it's actually quite nice as a configuration language uh, and way to build stuff. But then I came around another roadblock that was quite annoying because most of the time I want singletons in my application graph like a connection pool, just one. But sometimes I don't want this. I want two components of the exact same type to be configured slightly differently. And that's really annoying because everything in here, when you're using type classes, everything is type directed. For one type, you just have one instance and uh, there's no way around that. That's how it works. And if you tell this to uh, Haskell people, they will generally tell you, well, use new types if you're not happy. But new types are not always convenient, because if this component comes from a library that is used itself by another component, that's some source code I don't necessarily have easy, easy access to. And I don't want to have to modify the whole chain of components to just change one type that is very, very down the chain. It's just impractical. I cannot do this. Wow. So. It, really annoying. Uh, I don't really know how to abstract around arities. I have this kind of duplication between the constructor function and between the type classes. I have this case where, depending on the context, I want things to be slightly different, even if they have the same type. Then you know, sometimes you, you, you start something, you're very enthusiastic, and you have some roadblocks like this, and you're thinking, I don't know, I still have to deliver like tomorrow, what should I do? It's complicated. And so a colleague of mine, Simon, said, OK, we need more type classes and more types. And he went and tried to implement something which is even crazier, which is like, uh, let's put, try to represent the full graph inside the type system. And it can be done. 
and I was skeptical, but he actually he did something that's very close to this, but look at the tags, they are pretty crazy. Not only crazy, but look at this part. No inline bake, otherwise the simplifier explodes. And, uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I, was, I was truly uh, impressed. But at the same time, it was like a big contradiction with my goal number one, which was like simplicity. <laughs> I was, yeah, I want to be able to ramp up like Scala, Scala programmers who never touch Haskell, being able to progressively <coughs> write some Haskell and, and be productive with it. I was afraid that this would not work. So, okay, back to the drawing board. Uh, how can we start again from first principles and try to find something that's possibly going to work? Functions, 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 okay? That's the thing we want to use, functions. They are very simple. So now, instead of starting with this idea of a registry where we put stuff and we start with putting our configuration, so what happens if we also put our constructors inside the registry? What happens if we put those functions inside the registry? Well, actually, that it's actually quite nice because it gives you an idea for an algorithm. Um, here, if I want to build an authentication component, and this is the state of my registry, what can I do? Well, I go through the registry and I say, oh, I, I know there's something that's going to return an authentication thing, but, oh, that's a function, so, okay, I need to execute it. Can I execute it? Well, look at the input parameters. Do I have these input parameters? Actually, yes. It turns out that in my registry, I have uh, a component for logging, and I have some config for this authentication component. So I know how to build it, just grab those two things, execute the function, and then I have my authentication component. Now if you scale this idea to more components, more constructors, more pieces of configuration, well, you know how to build everything. It's just function application driven by an algorithm. And this is in a library now called registry. So you can use this thing to uh, build your applications uh, just by putting functions in a data structure and using a simple algorithm. And before we see how to, uh, how to uh, use all of this on a real application, because there are actually more real life problems that you have when you want to really start and build a, a real application, let's have a look what that gives us over using type classes. Because type classes are kind of solving the same problem. The difference is that type classes are provided by the language. But they are doing the same thing. They are doing some automatic wiring for you based on types. So it's a type-driven resolution of instances, picking the right thing and doing all the wiring for you. So how would we uh, do some uh, create a, an encoder type class, <coughs> but without type class? So let's say I have a structure where I have a company, departments, and employees. It's very uh, tree-like structure like this. And I want to encode that structure into some JSON, right? So I have things to encode, like the, the leaves of the data structure, like the name and the age. And if I want to encode an employee, well, I can use the primitives in my JSON library to put the name in a, in a, in a field, the age in another field. Then if I want to uh, uh, create an encoder for the department, well, I can reuse the encoder for the employees. And for all the employees in my department, I'm going to do the encoding, put that in an array. Same thing for the company, because I have an encoder for the department, I can reuse that department encoder, and eventually I have my company encoder I can give to you, and now you really, you can encode every company, and you're happy, except that you're not happy, because look at this, this is really ugly, this is obj n, a, That's, those fields are really crappy, I don't want those fields, I want nice fields like name and age, but I just gave you a company encoder, and how can you change what's inside the company encoder, you cannot, so, the only thing you can do at this stage is open up all the functions to change the behavior of this recursive encoding. So you have to have an employee encoder that's going to take two other encoders. You have to have a department encoder that's explicitly taking the employee encoder, company encoder taking the department encoder, and then eventually you've opened enough of the structure to be able to inject exactly what you want. But that's not really fun because it's totally boilerplate, something that can be totally derived you just using types. So you can also put all of those functions in the registry and now say, give me a company encoder, and the registry can do that thing for you. It can say, oh, to build a company encoder, I know that I need a department encoder, 
and so on and so forth until it has built the full thing. And if at some stage you're not happy with something, like, okay, I don't like this employee encoder because the fields, they look wrong, the field names, blah, so they are bad. Well, you can, uh, well, that's how you make um, um, an encoder for the company. Just say to the registry, please make me one, and you specify the type. But if you want a different behavior for something that's very deeply nested, well, you can just add it on the top of the registry. And then the algorithm, because it's pretty simple and proceeds from top to bottom, if it finds something that's, that's already there, that fulfills the, the requirements, like, okay, that's, this thing has the type of an employee encoder, so that's the one it's going to take, and that's going to be a better choice because it will have the, the, the proper field names. So that's a very easy way to override things, whereas in, uh, in Haskell, you would start by using either new types for these things, or maybe overlapping instances, or it starts to become a, a bit complicated. But here is just one algorithm and the data structure. Does it warn you if you accidentally override something? Um, no, but I'm going to t tell you about the, um, what it can warn you about, okay? Yeah. Um, that's the part about static checks here, okay? Mm -hmm. So it can do lots of things uh, because effectively to build applications, we need lots of different things. Um, but first, I, I want to say a few words about, okay, what is it? How is it implemented and what does it look like? So it relies on three type classes in Haskell. Uh, show, because we want to be able to display what's in the registry as much as possible. We need type able, because we need to know the types of the things we put inside the registry. We need to track their types, because there are still a bit of type uh, resolution. And it uses, crucially, this uh, dynamic data type, where we can apply a function to some parameters without having to know it's like runtime application. Because we are going to put those functions and those parameters inside the, the registry as a simple data structure. Um, so the first part about having show and typeable allows you, allow, already gives you some power. So you can do things like create a simple registry and right away see what's inside. So all the values are going to be displayed as values and the functions are going to be displayed well as functions, right? Uh, so you can already inspect what's in there. But you can already do more because now you have in your registry all those functions and they declare some dependencies between each other. All the types, they have dependencies. So <coughs> without even running anything, without even starting your application, you can right away use this structure to derive a dot uh, diagram of your full application. And you can see, oh yeah, effectively I can see that this logging component is really singleton. That's exactly what I was expecting. So that's another way to check if your configuration is correct. Um, but then if you've played before with dynamic and if you hear dynamic and uh, in Haskell, you might think, oh, is that thing type safe? That looks really scary to use something that's dynamic in a type safe language. So what kind of checks can we do to make sure that we can really extract stuff from the, from the registry? And actually, it's not that hard. Uh, so it's encoded in a type class called solvable that's describing exactly if it's effectively possible to build something of type A from that registry. And there are not so many conditions you need to check because if you want to build something uh, from type A from the registry, you need to make sure that it's at least the output of one of the functions uh, or of the registry, or maybe it's a value that's already there. That's one condition. And the other condition is that if it's the output of one function, you need to make sure that you can uh, recursively build all the inputs. So you need to make sure that all the, the list of all the inputs is included in the list of all the outputs, or the other way around, I never remember. Okay, I leave this as an exercise. And, and then you need to make sure that you don't have any cycles. And that one is a bit trickier to implement at the type level. So that one is not implemented at the type level at the moment, but you will get a nice error message to say, oh, your registry is actually circular because you put two functions in there, one from string to text, the other one from text to string that's going to cycle forever. So the, the algorithm is going to detect if you really have this case and going to report, uh, okay, now apparently we've entered into a cycle, which by the way is very unlikely if you're developing an application because you should have other bells ringing if you start having components, uh, having cyclic dependencies in your application. Uh, if there are just modules in Haskell, generally just Haskell will tell you, it will tell you well, you have files that, are, that have a cyclic dependency that's already bad. So this is not a situation that sh you should have. 
Um, we still have an issue with this solvable type class is that it's using um, effectively a list of types at the Haskell level. And it's, it can be slow if you have lots and lots and lots of types. Uh, and uh, it would be much better if we, have, if we had um, set type level sets in Haskell. Uh, it's using type level lists. There is an implementation for type level sets in Haskell. It's unfortunately, it's too slow. It's horribly slow. It's like if you have a, a list of more than seven or eight types, it just takes forever to compile. So I raised an issue against that. But I, I, I think that's something that will have to be fixed at the language level. I'm not sure that's something that can be fixed really at the library level. So there are some variants uh, the, that are there to just lift some of the constraints. OK, make it fast. And for test or make it unsafe, if you don't, sometimes it's not so bad. Uh, if you're writing some tests, uh, if it, it can grow up in your console, it's not a big thing. But then it will be fast. Or you can make either, and you get an either explaining if you could make it, make, create, extract something out of the registry or not. OK, so that's quite cool, because now we can build stuff. Uh, but we still have some other issues to, uh, to solve. When we create an application, uh, some of those components, they are not pure. They are effectively doing stuff. When you start accessing a database, you are creating a connection pool that consumes some, some resources. So it's effectively in I.O. Those components, they are constructor, they are going to have some effect. Um, and this is kind of annoying because we have a simple algorithm, just apply value to functions, and now <coughs> we have some mismatches between the functions because this function uh, is actually going to be um, returning a logging component but in I.O. But this constructor requires reliability here, requires um, a logging component but not in I.O. So, uh, the, 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 what can the algorithm do in that case? It has an I.O. of logging, but it needs a, just a logging. So the trick is to lift everything to I.O. and lift all the registry. Sorry, was too fast? Yeah. So in that case, we lift <coughs> everything we put inside the registry. If it needs to be effectful for building applications, generally it is. You are going to lift all the, um, everything you put inside the registry, all the parameters, all the functions, all of that to the same kind of base monad. That would be your start monad if you want. I find this unfortunate that we have to add like uh, one more level of indirection, one more thing to learn, uh, one, one more, a few more combinators to learn about the library and so on. But the good thing is that it, it keeps the, the main algorithm very simple, which is just apply parameters to functions. And it's easy to debug, it's, that one is pure, so that uh, it has some, some good properties. Um, okay, other, is that thing not working? Okay, so that's an example of, uh, of what, what it means. So it becomes slightly more complicated, but with type applications, it's actually not that bad in Haskell. Okay, so we have other problems to solve, and uh, I was really disappointed with this one, because the, the whole purpose of, of changing the strategy and building stuff right from the beginning is to have those singletons made proper made correct from the beginning, like just one element. But that doesn't really work well with effects. Because when you create a database component like this, it creates an I.O. of database, right? It's going to start uh, by instantiating a, a connection pool and so on. So what you put inside your registry is effectively an action that's going to create a connection to the database. But every time you reuse this action, if there, even if there's just one action, that action is going to be called every time it's used. So it's going to effectively create a new pool every time, even if that's the same action. <sighs> that's really annoying. S but the, there's um, an easy workaround for this, which is to memorize this action, which means that in that case, you can, you can say, oh, by the way, this database, I want it to be memorized. I want to make sure that it only executes the result, the, this thing once. And that means that the registry construction will itself be in I.O. More complication, but solving real-world problems. Ah, this thing about context, remember? About having the same component of the same type, but instantiated slightly differently, like this. Um, so, well, more combinators on top of the registry. You have, it's an algorithm after all. So we are free to tweak it. We are free to add more, uh, more branching conditions to it. So we can say, well, by the way, when you're trying to build this um, event listener, but in the context of a product consumer, so in my tree, 
I know I want to build a listener here in that context, well, in that case, use this configuration. If you are in another part of the tree, in another context, well, you use a different configuration. And the algorithm is going to check, okay, is there any specialization that I should take care of when I'm building everything? If there are such specialization, it's going to use them to build exactly what's needed. So that solves that problem, and that also means that I can now, I don't have to new type anything anymore. Even if I have things of the, of the same type that are coming from a library, that, that are being used remotely by something else, I don't have to worry about new typing them. I know that eventually I will be able to wire them exactly with the right configuration as I wish. Which for me was really important because at this stage, what I really wanted to build was also an ecosystem of reusable Haskell libraries that we could uh, share across projects. Um, okay, and the last part uh, about using a registry on a real application is resources. Because uh, anything that you start, like a connection pool, uh, you want to make sure that you're effectively closing it. So there is this RIO data type, which is like registry IO, not to be uh, mixed up within, there's another RIO monad in the Haskell ecosystem. This one means registry IO. It's basically a resource T over IO that, that gives you some additional capability of starting an application, doing some stuff with it, and eventually uh, shutting down all the resources that you allocate in each component. Nothing more than this. Okay, um, and um, maybe to conclude, I don't know how much time I have left. Not, not a lot. Five minutes. Five minutes, okay, so let's be quick. Um, I want to talk about data generation. So, Philip talked about uh, using generators and uh, how you can uh, change your generators for different data types and so on. And it turns out that registry is really well suited to do some very nice thing for generating complex uh, data models where you have like a hierarchy of things that stand together, like company, department, employees. All of a company here, data type, has a constructor called company. This is just a function, so I can put it in my registry. And if I lift everything to the gen monad, which is provided by the uh, Ascal Edgehog library, so it's, there's a generator monad in this library, um, all the functions are going to use generators. So if I want a generator for a company, and if I can provide generators for everything else in my tree, uh, everything will be uh, wired uh, properly. And that's really cool, because then that means I can also say now I want ints to be generated differently. And I can override the default generation for ints and have something else if I want. And again, this is related to type classes. There's, there's a reason why this library, Edgehog, said we don't want the arbitrary type class in Haskell because it's very inflexible for testing. There's only one instance per type. And in testing, many times you want many instances for type. You want uh, positive in ints, you want negative, you want a bad transfer of this, bad transfer of that, and so on, for essentially the same things. So you want to constrain a lot more your, your types and how the values are being generated. So that's why they got rid of this, uh, of this idea of using a type class. And I think that's where uh, registry really fits in really well. Um, what else can you do? That thing doesn't work. Okay. Um, okay, so you can grab a registry by using the make function on the registry, build a company, and you can do even more things. So you can have some combinators that are going to generate relationships between your data. Like I have a list of things, but how many do I want to be generated? One, two, n, whatever. And this is also a function. That's a function that takes a generator that produces uh, produces another generator. And if you put those functions inside your registry, that means that locally you can override them. And you can say, hey, maybe I want to generate my list slightly differently for just for that test case. And if you, so you can do this for maybe lists, non-empty. And then you can push this idea further because every time you change your registry, you're effectively changing some state, right? You're taking an existing registry, you're tweaking it to have a slightly different behavior to get a new registry. Well, okay, so you can say now I want a registry that's going to only generate one employee per department. Okay, so you grab your generator for employees and you just make sure you only ever take one. And you can also say I want one department per company. And then you can compose those two functions. You can say now I want a minimal company by saying, okay, this will have just one employee and one department. By composing those functions that transform your registry, you constrain the exact behavior you want for your generation. That means you can have 
pretty complex setups for the data you want to generate, and it is all compositional. You can add more of those constraints. You don't have to rewrite anything else. Just add one more constraint that's local to your test. Uh, so that was used at Zalando to generate uh, models of shoes and whatever, and that data model is um, quite complicated. So here I want a list of non-empty media. Um, here I want to say things, oh, I want the media size to be incorrect. And, and then because I, that's what I want to check, I want to check that my media is good or not. And this replaced some code where we, we were using lenses before. Like you have big data structure. So we were like creating a proper model of a shoe and so on. And then using lenses, we're saying, okay, now, now change just that part. But the thing is, this hard codes the path into your data model. That means that if your data model changes, well, you have to change that code everywhere. That code is used everywhere. It has to be changed as well. It, it's, it's less easy to refactor your code. Okay, so and since I give that presentation the first time, I've added a bunch more new features. So the first one is uh, memoize all. Uh, because most of the time you want to <coughs> memoize everything, so this RIO monad now supports a memoize all thing that's going to memoize all the actions, give you proper singletons everywhere. Um, another thing that's very useful for generating uh, data is when you have ADTs, because ADTs, each constructor maps to the same type. And in the normal registry algorithm, once you find a function that returns you the one given type, that's the first one you take. You don't see don't have a look at the rest. So there's a trick to be able to use all the constructors and then to have a, a choice between all the constructors where you can randomly select one of them. And that's by doing a, a bit of, a, of tagging. You can see that on the website. And specialization was also uh, improved in the sense that previously I was saying, okay, under a given context, use this configuration, but sometimes the context needs to be actually a, a path of different nodes inside the tree. You need to be more specific than this. So you need to say, when this component is used with that one, with that one, then use this configuration. So now it can be done with a, like a more uh, complex uh, language, if you want. So oops. the idea is to, it's just another way to remove some boilerplate uh, for how we build applications, how we create generators or encoders. And type classes are one interesting design point in that space. But uh, I'm here to say that there are other design points. Uh, uh, I mean, what Philip presented is also another design point by uh, encoding much more things as data types and families uh, that are abstract and that are related with a bunch of operations. But this is, uh, and I think one approach is more static than the other, maybe. Uh, I would love to do a more precise comparisons of, uh, comparison of the two. But this is another way to, to remove this border plate and give, and give you lots of flexibility without using too much uh, type trickery because eventually this is just function application. It's supposed to be simple. And that's it. I wonder if you have questions. Um, maybe one or two, if, if there's anything. Yes, Mike? Oh, Yes. Right. So could you have, uh, let's say, two different ways of serializing the same type? Let's say you have two, uh, you cannot express, uh, you want strings sometimes to be serialized that way, sometimes to be serialized that way. So I guess the switching between types in that case? No, specialization. The thing with specialize oh, okay. would say, uh, I want strings to be serialized that way if I'm talking about a customer. Yeah. But if I'm talking about uh, the bank, I, would, I want strings to be serialized that way. Right. That's you use you use specialization to do this, yeah. and that should work. Okay, another okay. question. Thank you. Well, it's more of a remark emphasizing what you said about the type classes, right? I mean, one problem is the types get more complex, but they also get more brittle, right? in that as, as your type classes get more complex, this is something that's subject to subtle, subtle, subtle changes in the compiler. 
And I've seen programs that have complex type class machinery break uh, because of some GHC update. And also, it's very difficult to develop this systematically, right? It, it feels a lot like tinkering. If you're trying to write it in such a way just that it will go through the compiler. Yes. Um, and I think that, that makes your approach uh, clearly preferable. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Then, thanks for the talk.